you know, making movies is hard. Making movies is hard. Welcome. This is a podcast about the struggle of being an independent filmmaker. I'm Alec Purcell, the founding host of the podcast, and I'm a sci-fi horror filmmaker, and my first feature film, The Alternate, will be coming out September 13th. What, what, what? So mark the date and uh, pre-order the movie when I put the link to pre-order it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Liz Manish. I'll be the first person to pre-order it. I am a writer, director, producer who has made two features and is currently in development on a smattering of others. I'm a distribution consultant who does sales, and I used to manage Sundance's creative distribution initiative. This week, we welcome seven-time feature filmmaker Richard Leeds on the show to talk about his latest feature, Adieu Lacan, about Jacques Lacan, called by some the most controversial psychoanalyst since Freud. Richard talks about how he's able to shoot the film in 10 days and his minimalist approach to indie filmmaking which makes it possible. After that, we discuss an article about the Rotterdam Film Festival firing its programming team, and then we read a listener email. But first, Ulrich, how are you? Doing well. Probably a little less busy than last week, which I think I was just out of control. But I'm like, I'm helping out on this movie that I'm like, kind of like the picture car coordinator, but not really, but kind of. And yeah, it's like a 70s piece. So it's like finding all these 70s vehicles and then just getting them on set. It's just tough, man. It's a it's a lot to try to do while you also have a day job to do, too. Wait, is and this a, an and addition a baby to the clearances tourists. thing? Is this the same mm-hmm. job as the clearances? It's the same. Okay. So the clearances got, well, actually, they're almost done. I'm actually waiting for one last little clearance thing. But like now, this was the next role they, they, they handed me off to. And I'm also like... It's like if they, they need a contract that, or like a some paperwork filled out like for a rental or whatever. They're like, oh, can you fill this out and send this in immediately? It's like, okay. You know, I'm like that guy, you know, just like sort of there in the background to help. But the thing that's the most exciting is, so I think I talked about like, you know, a few weeks ago, I pitched 12 ideas to these guys who had to lead to some investors. Yeah. You know, some money for a movie. And then a week or two ago, I got a word back. They liked two ideas. So we did our first pitch last week on Wednesday. And that went really, really well. And they're like, okay, can you do one more? Like, we want to do one more on Friday or, or Monday of next week. And I was like, okay, okay. And then after the first pitch, they were like, oh, we like it so much. Like, we, we, we'll see. We don't even know. But like, prep it anyways. So I was like, okay. And then on Friday, I'm just minding my own business, like, you know, doing, doing my thing. And then I get a text from my contact. And he's like, hey, can you join the meeting right now? Can you just get on? And I was like, oh, do you, do you want me to invite my team or anything? He's like, no, no, just you, just you. And they basically said, yeah, like we don't even like they originally they were going to pitch multiple ideas to their investors who have the money and like see what they picked. Mm-hmm. But they're like, we're not even doing that anymore. We love your idea so much. We love the movie. We're just pitching your movie to the investors only. Can you have a deck done by Monday morning? Oh my gosh. And like, it was really exciting. <laughs> exciting. And yeah, you know, they were really, really pumped on it. They wanted to like raise more money than the money they already had. They're like, really dreaming big and everything and like they originally we, we were they, they wanted it to be set in Prague and we would go to Prague to shoot it but you know we basically convinced them that like there's no point to go to Prague because the budget we'd have to be at to get the tax incentive is like really high there and so we're like oh we should just stay you know in the states or like maybe you go to Vancouver or something where like you don't have to spend as much you could still get the 30% a tax incentive and in Prague it's only 20% so, so 30% is much better so yeah, so we're like, you know, they're open to the states, and yeah, we're just waiting. Now we're just waiting to hear. I turned the deck in yesterday. I didn't hear anything. I've heard zero, just except besides we've we've got it. Thank you. And now I'm just waiting, <laughs> just waiting to hear what happens. I think what, what what the process is, they're gonna pitch the movie to the money people by themselves without the filmmakers, and then if that goes well, then we'll do a call all together. So it's still like many, many steps away from happening. But the fact that we got to the next step, like I've never gotten to the next step before on anything like this. So that's very exciting. That is really, really exciting. I was just thinking, because I was re-listening to our show with Naveen on my hike yesterday, and I was re-listening to you talking about about the original pitch. And then now it's like, it's really great for me because it's like, I just heard about the first pitch and now I'm like, immediately I have this new update from you about like the next steps. So I should just like constantly, it's, it's expediting the process of feature film development as an observer of your <laughs> life is what I'm saying. Like it's like, oh my gosh, things are moving so fast. Well, yeah. 
I think just realizing that it could fall apart at any moment, you know, like, like no matter how many yeses, like even if we like got to contracts, like even if we got cast attached, like all those things need to happen. Like it still could just like, you know, the pin could be pulled out and the whole thing would fall apart at any time. So I'm like trying, like I'm being excited and positive and like putting good vibes out into the world and like visualizing, you know, it coming together. But then I'm also just being really aware that, you know, like it's not a done deal until you're actually there making the movie. And even in that case, like it still could get pulled away from you like while you're shooting. So it's not until like the movie's actually done. (laughs) That it's real. Oh, not yeah. Until you until you sign the contract, and even when you sign the contract. Oh, here's something that I think is worth talking about. Is and it, I mean compared to the thing that was in my head prior to this idea popping in, is I have a sales client, one of my very first sales clients, and he, they signed a distribution contract, and then the distributor sat on their film for nine months without giving them a release date. And oh it's like, God. you think, oh, as soon as you sign the contract, everything's fine. Like I could breathe easy. And it's like, no, you can't. Because this yeah. distributor, like we're actually working to get the film back to the filmmaker and we're going to have no problem. And it's, it's going to be fine. But no, I'm warning every single filmmaker I know about this distribution company. And um, this is the third instance I've heard of this distributor dropping communication and not setting a release date with the film. Wow. And it's just so funny how, just like you're saying, how precarious and unstable everything is in that like you you actually have to wait until the film is released to breathe a sigh of relief. And even then, you can't really because your E&O insurance covers like one to three years. You could get sued. The distributor (laughs) could, you know, go into insolvency, become insolvent or, you know, there's like so many horrible things that just continue to happen and will continue to happen for the rest of time. And I know you're being very careful with your wording about things could fall apart, but I like that you are able to celebrate still at the same time. Yeah, I think you want to be excited about it, you know, and you you don't want to go into things like, oh, it's not going to work out because if you put that negative energy into it, then like that is likely that how it's going to turn out. Like it's not going to work if you don't believe it's going to work. But if you go into it thinking like, yes, like we can make this movie, this will happen. They will say yes. We will cast these actors. We will, you know, get the sign off on all, on all this stuff. Like, you know, then I think that's just a greater chance that that's the way it's going to work out, you know? Mm-hmm. But yeah, you know, it's, it's funny. It was also like this thing where like I read this script and I loved it from like the moment I read it. Like I was just like so super hooked. And then to like pass it on to like one other person who really liked it, two other people who really liked it. And then this whole team of people who all love it now. It's like, oh, I was right. Like the script's good. <laughs> like I'm not the only one who loves it. Like this is, this is, you know, I, my instincts were correct. So that was kind of, kind of fun. And also just to know that like, you know, everybody that you're with on this project, if they all love it, you know that you're got, you've got similar sensibilities that like, you know, it's all going to work out. And it's kind of freeing in a way that I didn't write it, that I can just sort of love it in a way where if I had written it, I probably, you know, it's a little harder to love something that you've, <laughs> that you've written, well, you know, because you're always criti- critiquing it and everything. Well, and also you're not so precious about it. Like there's certain things that I remember keeping in my film because of sentimentality that didn't really make a lot of sense for the plot. And it's like, you, you don't, <laughs> you're not stuck with that because it's someone else's original idea, right? And you can look at it with a little yeah. bit more distance. I did want to mention one other thing I'm going through because I think it's a value and it's kind of similar to what we're talking about because it's this idea of casting by committee. That's what I feel like I'm immersed with, immersed in with a lot of my projects that have larger teams in that you create these cast lists upon cast lists upon cast lists and then you vet them with everyone in the team and then you vet them with sales agents and then you vet them with distributors and financiers and you try to assess who has value and there's no objective value. So it's all subjective and it's all absurd. But what I did today is I have a project that is about to be bloated. And before it gets bloated, I call being bloated playing doing the development game before it's like (laughs) before it gets bloated i emailed the writer and i was like just just let me email this one actor's agent and see if he's interested just let me do that and she's like yeah like who let's do it and that's the kind of shit that i pull on my films when i write and i direct something i just go out to agents and managers myself and i just cast it myself and i i just decide who i want to be in the film and I, i haven't gotten a response from this agent but it has been tremendously freeing just to go after 
who you want, you know, and not feel like mm-hmm. you have to get permission with every single decision. So I think I'm going to do like a hybrid with this film where I take on that role, but we also kind of bloat the project with the suits if I can. When you say, for, I have a couple questions about what, what you just said. So first one is when you say bloated, what do you mean? Like, just like the team is going to get beefed up and like, what does that mean bloated? I think in an effort to get projects off the ground, at least I just try to find people who are like-minded, who have power and influence, and I try to get them involved in the project in some way. And sometimes it goes well, and sometimes it just slows down the moving train. And that's what I think feels inevitable about larger budgeted projects. It feels like there's always this expansion of the team rather than staying live is the word I want to use, but I don't think it's right. But rather than staying like small and speedy and in with an ability to pivot and, you know, there's like, so what I'm saying is I call it bloated when it's these projects with larger, larger budgets that have like 15 million stakeholders that you have to check in mm-hmm, on. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. everyone wants to pee on everything, which is what I talk about all the time. Everyone <laughs> feels like they want to pee on it because they want to prove their value. Yeah. Like, oh, well, what about this? Yeah. I heard this and I don't think that'll work. And I've heard this genre is less, ex- like it's all hearsay and and urine and i'm trying to avoid that and so i'm trying to go back to the impulsive liz of my micro budget features but to do it with a bigger project that's awesome we'll see second question is when you write this this agent what do you say for this this project this this film is built up like a little bit like we have this is the one that has development funding this is the one that we have a law firm attached to it but we actually have a very small core production team so i told them how i heard about the project i give the log line i describe the role i mention like our humble brags and then i say let me know if you want the script and that's it. And this is an so agent you don't, that it's I. It's no offer. It's no. It's just like, oh no, we want. This we, time we have not. development money. Okay. Yeah, I didn't say that. I just said financing by, and because I, you know, I I said what was true. And then this is an agent I had corresponded with years ago for my first feature. So I was like, oh, we talked last because of this. Mm. So for me, it's just like pushing the door open a little bit. I think inevitably they're going to come back and either ask me questions or just decline or never respond. Like I'm not expecting Mm, to be mm -hmm. embraced. But what I love is like, at least I'm starting instead of waiting, Mm -hmm. which is much more rewarding for me. That's awesome. I uh, I asked for feedback on the deck right before we called because I hadn't heard anything. And they texted back (laughs) one thing he said. This is so stupid. Uh, We had a range of budgets in there because like originally it was going to be one. And then during the call on Friday, they're like, we want to raise X amount of dollars. We can. Oh, I know I can raise this money in no time. I'm like, okay, whatever. (laughs) We're just going to say a range. And then their note is change all numbers to the higher number. On the deck? In In the deck. Yeah. So there's no range anymore. I'm like, wow. Okay, good. <laughs> so I've had you're that going note. For it. I've had that note, <laughs> and I've also heard that note with regard to like like Sundance applications or whatever. There's this presumption mm. that if your budget is too low, it betrays a level of inexperience. But I actually think the higher budgets betray an experience because not not for your situation, Ulrich, but like there'll be people who put like crazy pie in the sky numbers on their yeah. decks. And it's like, well, then you have no concept of what how mark how films are being valued. So how are you going to argue a return on that very massive? Yeah. Number, right. Yeah. I feel like anyone who like doesn't have a connection to financing, if they're putting like over two million dollars or something on their tech, it's like, what are you talking about? Like, where is that money going to come from? Like, you have to know where that money is going to come from if you're going to think that you can actually make this movie, you know? And if you're if you're actually just trying to make it on your own, like, put a number that you can actually achieve, you know, that, like, seems reasonable for you, right? You know, that, like, based off of your experience and your connections. So, anyways. Just put together a budget where everyone gets paid, is what I say. You know, it's like, yeah. just just put something together where like you're putting the cost of the film in there and then Mm -hmm. you know that's what you need but what we need is for everyone listening (laughs) to support patreon don't forget to do that www.patreon.com slash mmih 
podcast. Also, don't forget to check out jambox.io, which is a royalty-free music and SFX company with an emphasis on high-quality cinematic cues. They have customized plans to fit your needs, and you can head on over there and you can use our promo code, capital M-M-I-H, to receive 20% discount. Mm -hmm. But without any more input from me, at the very least, here's our chat with Richard Lees. Well, we are here with Richard Leds. Welcome to the show, Richard. Can you give us an elevator pitch for your film, Adieu Lacan? It's about a, a young woman that travels from Brazil to Paris. And she initially is going to bring back the idea. She's fascinated by this French psychoanalyst who's you know considered one of the leading intellectuals at the end of the 20th century. She arrives, she meets him, and then she decides that she's going to do an analysis with him because she's so troubled by two miscarriages she's had and the separation, which she says is losing her husband, whom she loves, and just trying to figure out why her own path to motherhood has become an impossible one. So she decides to do an analysis with uh, Jacques Lacan. The film is basically her analysis with Jacques Lacan. How many days did you shoot? Ten. Oh, my God. Ten. It was pre, of course, pre-COVID, and we all got the most horrible flu. And in, when COVID hit, we all thought, oh, well, we already had it. That was that horrible thing we had, but it wasn't. And Ishmenia Mendez, who plays Sariema, the, the, the film's pro protagonist, who goes and does an analysis of Lacan, said that the, having the worst flu she'd ever had in her life really helped her, that she kind of just used it to go in in this kind of fog. And then, you know, through the course of the analysis, which we shot sequentially, which, as you know, you rarely get to do. Usually, if you have three bar scenes, you shoot them all at once. It's the only way you can do it. But this is the second time I've been fortunate enough to have a film that takes place in basically one location. So you And there are a couple of filmmakers who did this regularly. One is Michelangelo Antonioni, and the other is Robert Altman. And I've done a couple of films with Elliot Goulds, who you know was a key actor working with Robert Altman. And we improvise sequentially one film. And it's just an amazing way to work, for the, especially for the actors, because you know if they come up with something, they can work it into the film in a way that they can't necessarily do that if they've shot the, the last scene first. You know, they can introduce some little tweaky thing because it would have to be there in that last scene. But if you shoot sequentially, they can do that. And it's a really great thing when you have a chance. And this time we were able to do that. And it really helped the actors and I think helped the cinematographer, Valentina Coniglia and myself to really build in kind of radical choices that we would otherwise not have probably uh, had the courage to do. If you can say, what was the rough budget of the film? Well, I once heard David Lynch say about a film he did in Lynette, but I said it was under five million. Love I'm going to press it. I'm going to press it because I have to. I, I'm not letting you off the hook. Can you say, is it dramatically under five million? Can you use that color? Oh my God. <laughs> so dramatically under. Okay. Way, way <laughs> under. Like, drop a zero. <laughs> it's <laughs> way under that. <laughs> but, way, way under well, Okay. Way drop. Keep dropping zeros. But anyway, eventually you'll get there. 50 bucks. You got it. Awesome. <laughs> Amazing. I know you worked with existing source material, but how did you come up with the idea of, of doing this film? I was given a chance to do a staged reading of a play by Betty Milan. She's a, a Brazilian psychoanalyst and a friend of mine uh, who runs a psychoanalytic association in New York, a Lacanian psychoanalytic association, of which I've been a member for many, many years, ever since I was doing a doctoral dissertation on the rise of mental health care in the U.S. after the Second World War around treating veterans after I'd done a piece of performance art based on the records of my maternal uncle who had had a psychotic break when he was 
a veteran and had been 10 years in a hospital and either escaped or wandered off. You can't really tell, but he was hit by a train. And the record, he, you know, I was kind of named after him. He was named after his dad. I did this performance piece based on his records. And, and those records, not only, well, they were intended to tell a story about him, but they also told a story about the storytellers. And they told the story about that period of time. And with a little research, I learned that it had been this pivotal moment in the rise of mental health care in the United States after the Second World War around treating veterans. Um, they were what we call a non-stigmatized patient population. They were the mainly young men coming home from war. And so there was the money available uh, at that time to form the NIMH, which was formed right after the war, the National Institute of Mental Health. The first Mental Health Act is just after the Second World War. And there had been these conscientious objectors, Mennonites, religious conscientious objectors, who many of which had been sent into the hospitals to take these low paying jobs instead of as part of their work as conscientious objectors. And they were really smart and really organized, and they saw these horrendous conditions and they documented them. You know, they really didn't let it go. So at the end of the war, there was also all this documentation about how horrendous these hospitals were. And these became part of an expose that was in Life magazine. And anyway, so there was this whole kind of transformation where mental health care becomes part of American culture after the Second World War, not only in terms of treatment, but also in terms of the culture. You know, of course, there are the beat poets. J.D. Salinger had his own experience. So in many ways, so I became interested in that. And I was working with an anthropologist and he said, you know, Richard, it's great you're reading all these books, but if you meet the people who do this kind of work, you'll have a totally different feel about it. So I started to get to know all these clinical groups, psychologists, psychiatrists, psychoanalysts. And one of them was this group called Apre Coup, which I eventually became a member of. And for all these years I've been. So uh, and my, my first feature film was about lobotomy. So come on, that's a good direction, right? lobotomy to psychoanalysis. Come on. Yeah, you can't. Come on. <laughs> so I got a chance to do the stage reading of Betty Milan's play. And uh, a couple of things hit me right off. One was the story was incredibly accessible. You know, it was a story I felt anyone could get. And Jacques Lacan is known as being incredibly obscure, impossible to understand. So, and I knew it passed, it passed muster with this clinical group, these psychoanalysts. So I knew those who were deeply entrenched in a new well, the work of Lacan, thought it was okay. And I thought, wow, this could, somebody who knew nothing about his work could really get into this, could tell what he was doing. Lacan's ideas have become very popular in film studies, feminist studies, LGBTQ plus studies. You know, all in many different fields, there are there are groups that use Lacan's work. There are also groups that hate Lacan's work, but there are many that that draw on his work. But for the most part, there's not really a lot on the his practice. And if you show the practice, which is what this film does, it shows an analysis, basically soup to nuts. You get an idea of where the ideas come from, and they're much simpler that way. They're much more, e they're much easier to grasp. So since then, we've been showing it, I mean, through the website, we said, well, you know, if any groups want to see this film, if you can get 20 people, we'll do online. And that's been banana. I mean, that's just been fantastic. But mostly outside the United States and in, in like a whole bunch in Argentina and Brazil and Mexico and Scotland and England and Bulgaria, all over the place. And these are, you know, groups of people who are interested in psychoanalysis, mainly clinical groups. And, you know, it's just been really wonderful of spending a tremendous amount of time speaking about this film with these people, uh, you know, who are really, really lovely people for the most part. Just trying to, I know you talked a lot about your process of, of, you know, coming up with the idea, but how long did you spend working on the film from like when you had that first moment reading, reading the play to now when the movie's released? This one was, this one is, was a quickie. I've been working on a film about by another, uh, Betty was actually analyzed by Jacques Lacan, and this is her story. So I've been working for 
gosh, maybe 10 years on a film by another person that was analyzed by Jack Lacan, who passed away, a friend of mine named Alain Didier Weil. And he wrote a play that I've also been wanting to make into a film called Vienna 1913, which is about basically Sigmund Freud and the rise of anti-Semitism in Vienna before the First World War. So that I've been trying and trying. Now, finally, it looks like I'm going to be knock on wood shooting it this fall. But so, so I had been thinking about, you know, filming someone lying on a couch. I mean, you know how there are some filmmakers that are really good for love scenes and others that do car crashes or gunfights. I'm going to become the director, you know, where they go, oh, we got a person lying on a couch three or four times. Ah, leads, you got to get him. No, he's the guy. You you want to, you can have somebody lying on a couch a lot. He's the guy. He knows how to do that. So, you know, I'm working on that niche. Wait, did I miss the timeline though? (laughs) Yes, we did. When did you read the play? Oh, I knew I'd forgotten something. (laughs) I'd forgotten the question. (laughs) Gosh, I would say it was quick. So I would say it was 2018. And we shot this December 2019. And compared to all the all the other projects you've worked on, how difficult was this one? You know, it's really hard to say. You know, it's they're all terribly frightening in some way. You know, I think of it as like mountain climbing where once you get to the top, you turn around and you go, oh, my God, you know, I could have fallen. What was I doing, you know, in terms of casting, in terms of so many things, you know, just how lucky you are to to have made it. But in the moment, you don't look down, you know, or I've learned, I don't know what it is just to keep going and, and you know, okay, there was, you know, a couple things that I thought would be in place that radically were not. But, you know, we kept going and I'm you know, just really, really happy with this film. And it's, it's going to be released on platforms May 10th, but showing it to these different groups around North America, South America and Europe has been just really so far so far, so good. I wanted to hear about the, the, the $50 question. Like, how do you raise the money for your films? Like, what, what is your process for that? You know, there are a couple people who I've been going to for years that sometimes have made money back and sometimes haven't and, you know, continue to put in money. Then there's fundraising through, uh, I've raised money, for, again, through people who give small amounts and then larger amounts. And in this case, people who are interested in psychoanalysis as well have been willing to put some money into it. So it's basically, you know, kind of a case by case basis. But I was able to make this one for, you know, as I said at the beginning, significantly under $500,000. I was able to just to raise the money. Yeah. And I know that you're a highly decorated filmmaker and you've made a lot of really solid projects. But I would say looking at it as if if someone knew nothing about you, they would say, well, he chose to make a black and white film about an obscure psychoanalyst, right? And I think uh, uh, the pressure that a lot of indie filmmakers have is to like witness and try to anticipate market trends or try to convince people of commerciality. Does that enter your mind or are you just driven to tell the stories you want to tell? No, it has, but it hasn't. You know, I did a horror film that was horrifying for the investors. And <laughs> what does that mean? It, I mean, it didn't do what it was supposed to do. You know, it, it, they, you know, that was the money was pretty much lost. Mm-hmm. After that, I made a film. Uh, you know, my, my mom came down with Alzheimer's and I shot a film in the house where I'd grown up with Elliot Gould. And that was the other film I got the shot in sequence. And at that point, I didn't give a fuck if anyone watched it. You know, it was like, you know, I'm going down with the ship. Fuck you. Fuck everyone. I'm going to make this fucking film. And guess what? People liked that film. That film did well. You know, we got a good review in the New York Times. We actually worked with the Alzheimer's Association, found theaters all across the country that would show it. So, you know, I kind of felt after that was a little bit like, 
you know, don't project onto the other what they want necessarily, or, you know, that you can get into a lot. I mean, it's, a, of course, you want to make back the money, but it can be a trap to think you know what the other wants in some kind of way and then not do what you want. I mean, I think that is really can be a trap. You know, you should, as Lacan would say, you need to sustain your own desire. You know, you need to sustain your own, just don't give up on your own desire. So, do you know what went wrong with the horror movie? Like, why it wasn't a good experience or didn't do well? Or did it come out? Like, was it just did not get made? Like, what was, how did that work? Oh, the one I'm talking about that did badly? Yeah. No, that one got, it got made. It just, and I, I you know, I like the film. It had some, had some wonderful people in it. You know, there, there are things I really like about it. You know, it's about a family where this Greek American guy basically decides he has to lynch his son to prove he's white. You know, it's about the history of wow. racism in the U.S. and kind of, Jeez. you know, including what now is conceptualized as white, but uh, historically, you know, some people were whiter than others. And then those kinds of things, those kinds of, you know, that goes back to the 1920s, the passing of the 1924 Immigration Act that famously was used to turn back a boat of Jews that were coming to this country, but was also aimed at Irish and Southern Europeans. So that was something that very interested me and you know, had a really good cast, among which were Michael Imperioli and Wendell Pierce are in that film. But, you know, for whatever we, I'm, I, you know, again, I'm, I'm really happy it's out there and it's now available on a couple different streaming platforms. So, and, and people are still occasionally, you know, turning to it and I find out about it and like the film, but man, it sunk like a stone. Like I couldn't, you know, wow. it just sunk to the bottom of the ocean. Really bad feeling. <laughs> I want to acknowledge that Ulrich and I, like, this is our favorite type of question is asking about sustainability and like how, and I, I just want to acknowledge that what we're trying to do is like figure out how to have a career like you have had and like, how do we get right. under the hood for ourselves? So can you speak a little bit about like how you've been able to sustain a world where you could just make project after project? Is it that, you know, a few of the films did hit? Or are you doing, are you diversifying your income on the side in some way? Is it living in France? Like, do you, can you point to a few strategies possibly? Oh, I, there's some money coming in from the films and, you know, doing various things, construction, teaching, tutoring, and then having, you know, some people who I've run into who have, you know, stayed involved and been willing to, you know, help fund my work. You know, it's a combination, a whole bunch of different things. So, as like a six or seven time feature filmmaker, like, do you pay yourself out of your budgets now when you make a movie, or are you still just doing it how you would have done your first projects, where you just don't take a fee and you just put it all into the movie? I still don't take a fee, and I put it all in the movie. Well, it depends. I have on occasion. Not what I wanted to hear, Richard. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's very. It's not what I want to say either. <laughs> You know, there have been there have been exceptions. You know, there have been cases where you know prior to 2010, prior to the housing crisis, you know, there were some people with deep pockets who put money in, and you know, I had I had more of a budget, and the film did well, won prizes, and everything got a lot of circulation, made money, everyone was happy, and that one I you know. That one I, I took a, a, a good size salary on. But I want to talk a little bit about working with actors. And by the way, Elliot Gould and Michael Imperioli are like two of my favorite actors. Like how cool it yeah. is that you've gotten to work with them. I have a presumption that you create a very supportive, freeing environment yeah. for them. I'd love to hear how you set up a place where they're comfortable to, to trust and uh. explore. Well, I think, you know, I always start, I always think the conversation is very important, as well as, I mean, you know, it, it doesn't take a genius to put Michael Jordan on your basketball, you know, team, you know, anybody. So, you know, these are great actors. There are other times I've cast people who are not at all known. In this film, 
you know, David Patrick Kelly is a well-known, uh, most recently for Twin Peaks, but he has a long career. Whereas Ishmania Mendez, you know, she's near the, the start of her career. And, you know, she's, she's extraordinary in this film. So it's when I cast people that really have no track record or very little and they're just great, that then I feel like, well, maybe I'm doing the right, you know, I should have done this all. <laughs> and, but I would say is the personal rapport, the one-on-one. -on -one. You know, we're not going to be spending a long time together in the course of their life, but, you know, just really you know, respecting them one-on-one -on -one because in the intensity of work, you are not going to have the luxury of sitting down and talking about your mom or their mom. But if you've taken the time up front, you know, I think I'm a good listener. You know, it's not by chance I'm interested in psychoanalysis. And uh, I think actors feel respected and listened to. And I, I love actors. I believe they really are the center, you know, like Orson Welles. I believe they really are what it's all about. And to mention another, to mention a French filmmaker, Godard, you know, said every film, whether it's fiction or documentary, is on some level a documentary. Right? I mean, it documents those people at that time. Hmm. So if you keep that in mind and really keep their presence foremost as what you're capturing, then you can make the best possible film. And I, I think they know I, I put that kind of value on, on what they're doing. And do you ever get t time to rehearse with any of your actors? Or are you always just jumping right in like first day on set and, and that's it? No phone calls, no prep, no anything? I usually, we do rehearse, but we usually rehearse on the day. You know, I will do a couple readings beforehand, but I don't necessarily feel starved for rehearsal time. But, you know, there are filmmakers uh, whose work I love who rehearse you know, for long periods of time. And then the end result is it looks so sp spontaneous. So, you know, I'm not, I don't think the way I do it's the only way to do it. It certainly, you know, costs less money. But, Oh, it, I love to rehearse, but we'll usually rehearse on the day, in the moment. And there's a great feeling of luxury. I mean, I, I get, you know, these wonderful people and, you know, everybody leaves us alone for a little bit of time and we, and we play around, you know, and we go, okay, come on back in, come on in, look what we've made up, you know, and uh, so that's, ah, I just love that. That sounds nice. I'd love to hear a little bit more about how you cast. I mean, seeing how you work in different budget levels, sometimes a casting director fee precludes or or can take away from an already small budget. Yeah. And I'm curious if you have relationships with casting directors, if you go directly to talent, if you've already, if you've established relationships through other means, how do you do it? Well, both. Um, there is a casting director I've worked with, well-known casting director many, many times on many different, on budget different size budgets. It's Billy Hopkins and Ashley Ingram, who works with him. And they've been really just wonderfully supportive of my work. And I'm deeply grateful to them for their support. You know, they, they know that I will, I will keep going. Uh, I don't necessarily, if I don't get, you know, Tom Cruise for my film, you know, it's it's still going to what somebody laughed. That was a chuckle. I mean, come on, Tom. I'm sorry, <laughs> but there's so many. I mean, especially in New York, if you're working from New York or if you're working from LA, or there, it's a deep bench of acting uh, of actors. So if if given an opportunity, I mean, I just did a I did another film after that. Um, Adieu Lacan for a fraction of what Adieu Lacan cost. And, you know, we were able to cast and shoot that in five days. And just a wonderful cast, a great cast. So, and also at times it's people I, you know, they're, I go back, you know, work again and again with people. I've worked twice with Wendell Pierce, a number of times with Bill Raymond, uh, you know, a number of actors I've gone to work with again and again. And that's always a pleasure. And, and every once in a while, you know, through a connection, somebody uh, says, hey, you know, I, I think you should really show this to this person. And then it turns out they, they really want to do it. So, you know, it's a, it's a combination of different, different ways. So, 
how do you make a movie in five days? Like, how do you schedule that? And how do you shoot a feature length film in that amount of time? Like, what, what is your process? Like, like, how are you working with your camera team to, to do that? Like, what, what is it? Or even 10 days. I mean, I, I, I struggled to make a movie in 19 days. So, like, I'm curious, like, how you're able to do this. You know, Hong Sang Soo is a Korean filmmaker I got very interested in. Every scene is one shot and cameras on a tripod. It's in one position. It can pan, tilt, and zoom. That's it. And the whole, every scene is one shot. So you have 15 scenes, that's 15 shots. And you're going to put them in that order. And that's it, you know, and that's how you do it. And I've only done it once that way, but I really, really liked it. It was very interesting. It's tough in some ways, but it's... So his, his films were a real discovery for me. You know, I like this idea that Paul Schrader talks about transcendental cinema, you know, going back to Resson and Ozu and Victoria de Sica. And for example, he mentions, and there's, it's on YouTube this, where he's talking about it, and there's this clip from Victoria de Sica's Umberto D, where there's this young woman trying to, who's working, obviously, in this horrible working conditions in this kitchen, and she's trying to light a match, and she keeps trying to light it. And, you know, and he says the camera just stays on her, and that there was what he calls transcendental cinema is that, you know, it kind of says, he says, most films try to grab you by the throat and never let go. You know, there's a kind of action, action. And then he says there are other films which kind of lean back and don't go after you. And you either let them go. Uh, Chantal Ackerman is another filmmaker he mentions in this group. Or you start to lean in. You, you decide you are going to look at a door, empty door with no movement for 50 seconds. And then it starts to, something starts to work. And when that happens, he says, you create just a whole other kind of experience. And I think that's really interesting. I think it's also really interesting now in this world where we're just completely bombarded with images to kind of actually use cinema to create kind of a shelter, if you want, almost from the bombardment of images to give them a kind of structure and coherence and form in their relationship to each other. You know, and also that has a relation to psychoanalysis in that, you know, in analysis, the idea is, you know, you tell your big story and then you mention, and also there was, uh, in the, it doesn't matter, but there was also a mouse crawling across the ceiling, you know, and the mouse, well, what about the, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. what about the mouse? <laughs> So, you know, this kind of letting the mind float and decide where it wants to go. And this was also Andre Bazin. This is what he loved about the theater, uh, the cinema of Orson Welles as well was depth, deep focus was that the viewer could decide where to focus their gaze. It wasn't necessarily, they weren't necessarily being steered to one thing or another. So this kind of idea of the, the in a way that the production is completed by the viewer, that the viewer is a crucial point of where the of meaning of the film is going to take place, to me, is a uh, uh, really interesting idea. And it's what we tried to do with Adieu Lacan. I love that so much. I call those epiphany movies. They're like movies that when I smoked, I would have like with a coffee and a cigarette and I would just yeah. get high watching like because yeah. they pull you in. I had a question about audience building because I noticed you had like a newsletter sign up on your website, which I do. And I'm a big advocate for growing you your own audience. Up? No, I'm going to now, though. I was like, is this weird if I do it before the interview? Can you talk a little bit about audience ownership, like why you do that, why you communicate directly with your audience? Well, you know, it's interesting for this film. I, you know, I, I worked on this film with a marketing and distribution consultant named John Reese, who wrote a oh, book. I know John. Thinking outside of the box. Yep. I like, you know, so John, I uh, worked together and I, I like John a lot and it's gone very well. Maybe if it hadn't, I wouldn't be saying that. But this film worked out well. This, you know, I, I knew someone who had worked on when George Lucas was raising money for Star Wars. And Lucas would have behind him a map of the US with a pin for every science fiction club. And he would say to the potential investors, 
if Star Wars is a total bomb, if no one likes Star Wars, this is our safety net. This is our small. These people are so fanatic about science fiction films that even if everybody hate, everybody says, don't go see, they'll still go see this film. And so, you know, somewhere in the back of my head, when uh, one of the things going on when I, Betty Milan, when I did this stage reading to this psychoanalytic, Lacanian Psychoanalytic Association, and I've been involved with Lacanian Psychoanalytic Associations now for 20 years, was, wow, these people all through Latin America, all through Europe, all through North America and Canada are really connected to each other. You know, they're really, they have these small groups and they're, you know, they're very, they're very thoughtful, active people. They write, they think, they discuss, they're very interested in culture. And in the age of the internet, they've also, you know, that's become part of their world. So, you know, I did think that maybe, you know, John talks about affinity groups, you know, having like some set of groups. And I've done three films this that this way, one having to do with Alzheimer's, another with uh, refugees on the island or undocumented migrants landing on the island of Lesbos, and this film. And this film, particularly, the affinity group really has worked well. But it, you know, again, I think it's something that I also remember, you know, way back when Lucas this this guy who had worked Lucas Toy, but but then it was kind of you know kind of a safety thing. I think now for small independent films, it's if you if you if you have something like that, it, it can be incredibly helpful. And then you know trying to build and keep in touch with that audience. I mean, I think it's crucial. You know, it's crucial in so many ways. It's also crucial. I mean, if you believe as I do that the audience really plays an important role in terms of the reception and, and production of meaning of the film, you know, stay engaged with them and they're, they give you fuel, which can be money. But in most cases, it's just because, you know, one or two of them are going to reach out to you at a, at a difficult time. And, you know, you keep, you, you feel like, you know, you keep going. So I wanted to ask about like what you've learned over the, the five to seven features that you've made. Like, like, have you changed as a director from the first one to now? And like, what have you kind of taken away from your body of work that you've, you've been able to make over this, this, you know, the last 20 years? This, the first one starring Michelle Williams about a woman that wants to have a lobotomy in 1953. I storyboarded every shot, you know, and then I went through every shot with the cinematographer, Steve Kosmierski. And I've kind of moved away from that. You know, again, I think I've come to to respect the moment more and to feel that that's the kind of kind of work I want to do. I mean, again, you know, I think you kind of, you know, the poet Frank O'Hara said, if you're being chased by a guy with a knife, you don't turn around and say, give it up. I was a track star at Mineola Prep. You just run. And so, you know, and I think filmmaking's a little bit like that. You just, you know, I mean, if I had been given, I don't know, a chance to make a film with a $50 million budget, I, I, I would have, you know, I probably would have done it at the drop of a hat. But, but you know, I've been, a, I've been kind of just struggling to, you know, continue to make films and then what, where can I make them and how can I make them? And I, so I've become comfortable in this, lower budget, working with, you know, how do you turn limitations into strengths? Don't try to, you know, do things like Hollywood would, but with a tenth of a budget. I mean, it just looks like you had to, you know, do something. What, you know, how do you do something, you know, that isn't about shock and awe, but it's about, you know, the kind of work you see. You know, the thing is that one of the things about, wonderful things about Americans versus the French, uh, you know, again, I love a lot about France, but one thing is like a lot of Americans have always felt like they got the great American novel in them. Maybe not anymore because people don't write as much, but there was a way in which people felt that they could do it. They could go out, you know, they had, they could tell a story. Whereas in France, historically, there's been a ch sense of that that's about class in a particular way. And you can't, unless you're born into a, a group that can write, you can't write. And I think that's, 
in a way not i think there's a wonderful way in which that's not been a part of the american tradition and today of course we all carry around a video camera in our pockets everybody carries around a video pocket a video camera in their pockets or not everyone that's radically not true but a large group of people in the world do and so potentially those people can become filmmakers and i think it's interesting to make films that aren't shock and awe you know that films that don't you know say oh my god I, i'm bowled over oh my god i i was once i had for a while a role for a film and art center which i won't name but i was on a committee to help find new seating for they were going to build some new theaters some new cinemas and so a bunch of us got on a bus and we went around looking at different kinds of seats for cinemas and it was interesting in that you know some were like you know that you could and i i'm i love these but i you know but they you know you could get an injection they really they're just like you know you just go back and you can you know, get your injection and and then there are other cinemas that would have chairs which were more like you were seated to to make a decision to think about something you know you were part of some kind of group and you know i mean my own you know i've been very interested in in the relation of of theater to democracy going back to greek tragedy and then you know how how today a well run festival can be an incredible experience you know you you know we may be so far tragically far from any kind of democracy on a in an international way but you know if you go to a well run film festival i see exp- life experiences stories i never knew i never thought about and then they're you know they're so powerfully told and to be in one of those audiences you know you can really feel like wow this is this is where it's at this is something about the demos the people and you know it's it's a it's got a chance and everything you know so how you engage with uh, an audience again but the seating you know i mean the roller coaster thing hollywood is supposed to be about like a roller coaster experience totally passive you're locked in you can't and i admit i love those films sometimes you know i love to be just you know but i also really love deeply love films which are where you were in, engaged in some way i just i've been i i interviewed in a couple of weeks in my newsletter it's coming out in interviews i did with a friend of mine who's a french documentary filmmaker and we were talking about where we each came from when you know into filmmaking and i was you know my my dad was a book publisher and i kind of really thought of thing making a film as kind of making making some object and and my friend richard hamon came from a family communist family and he really thought about serving the people you know that he wanted to find a way to serve the people and what he would talk about is you know i wanted to make a film that was popular and you know for him popular goes back to the idea of the french commune and the people so i and i said to him you know we were talking i said well popular now means it opens in you know thousands of screens all over the world and it's you know a superhero film that's popular today and i so struck about the sense of popular and what it meant to him in terms of the paris commune in 1871 and you know how people kind of rose up not not just workers either that's uh, you know small business people all kinds of people just had had you know, had had enough and that was the idea of popular uh what he thought of and then what popular means now and i think about these you know these seats in the in the cinemas and you know how do we find a sense of popular a future sense of popular or the, or a sense of popular uh, you know which we need now particularly perhaps in the united states at this particular moment you know which is which is not going back to that but is but you know is still somehow you know deeply ingrained in 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 the american culture but at the same time is more engaged in a certain way and carrying something out from from the cinema into other areas and that has you know that that sense of popular as well this is very interesting you have me on like 15 million different threads let's do the last round as a speed round if that sounds fun we'll do rapid fire questions for you richard <laughs> 
What's the first film you ever made and how do you feel about it now? Blue. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Damn. Good color find. <laughs> the first film I ever made. Oh, gosh. Yeah. Super 8 fell onto the ground at some point. Oh, it was great. I still have bits of it and you'll be seeing them. Awesome. What's the best filmmaking advice you've ever received? Oh. <sighs> Know what you don't want to give up because you're going to have to give up a lot. But figure out what you don't want. You can't give up and don't give that up. What's the worst filming kid advice you've ever received? The worst film advice I ever, uh, ever received? God, I, I hate to say it because it's not bad advice, but for some reason, it's good advice. But for some reason, I hate it, which is... <laughs> Fast, good, and cheap. You can only ever get two out of three. And it's good advice, but for some reason, I hate it. Boy, I need to do an analysis. Okay, go ahead. Do you have a goal as a filmmaker? To make the next film. If you could go back in time, what's the piece of advice you would give your past self? Relax. <laughs> and final question, is making movies hard? Yeah, oh, very hard. Extremely hard. But then again, you know, I think, you know, life is... I mean, I th it's very hard, but it's, it's a, you know, how can you say this? It's a blessing too. I mean, to, to be able to choose some of your suffering, I mean, come on. I mean, you know, to choose some of your suffering, I mean, you know, it's not like you're not going to suffer, but you, you get to choose part of it. Oh man, come on. Uh, that's, that's pretty damn, you know, yes, it's really hard. How can people do you see call to action? How can people support you? Watch your movies. Oh, gosh. Visit, you know, uh, www.richardledass.com. Oh, sorry, <laughs> damn it. Dad, I'm so sorry. I don't know if you can hear me, but it's uh, L-E-D-E-S, richardledes.com. And uh, sign up for my newsletter. And, you know, my films are there. And there you go. Ark, what do you remember about our chat with Richard? I remember that when I asked him how to say his name, he said it's Richard Ledass. <laughs> he said it's anything but Richard Ledass. And no, then... I know, but you got to make it that joke. It was so funny. And then but he the... ended with the thing. It's like, oh my gosh. Yeah, it was really funny. I know, yeah, he said anything but. But the fact that he, he even put that out into the world, I thought was funny. Because like people who are, you know, sensitive about their names would, would never, ever like do something like that so like that instantly endeared me to richard and made oh. me think that this guy's got a good sense of humor he's really fun and nice and then we had such a great conversation i mean the thing that really really did strike 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 me though was this whole thing about this is like minimal minimalist filmmaking approach that he like was taken from this korean filmmaker where you each scene is one shot and you have to block the scene in a way where it works for one shot and just you have to be very creative with your with you know, blocking and framing and, and everything and your all the choices of the actors. And I was like, wow, like that's the first time anyone's explained to me like how you can make a movie in like 10 days. That doesn't sound stupid. <laughs> it's no offense yes. to anyone. But like, it's like, oh, like you could, like if you just plan it properly and you like really think about what you're trying to do with your frame and your scene, then yeah, you can make a movie in that amount of time because you don't have to do all the setups. You don't have to do all the coverage, you know? So I just thought that was very fascinating and, and really inspiring. I really want to do that. When he was talking about that, I was like, okay, I think I want to do that on my horror film because that's the horror, that's the film where we're trying to like break them. Oh, wait, do you think that's a horrible idea? Is horror film a bad idea to do? Wait, you're laughing. I think it's really funny because <laughs> horror is like the hardest thing to do that with because if, you, if you're going to have any kind of gore, you have to hide everything within the frame. Oh. And doing gore is all about like things being right off a of frame, quick cuts, like, you know, like that's how you sell the blood explosion is like you go to the wide to the tight and then back to the wide again. But if you try to do a blood explosion and only a wide, like you either have to have like the best like blood explosion people ever and mm -hmm. able to hide it or to paint it out in visual effects. Like I just feel like I don't know what kind of horror movie you're making. Maybe it's not that kind of horror movie. It's not. But like if there is any kind of gore, that would be challenging. But if it's not gore, maybe. I don't but know. You make a really, really good well point. In the it plays really well in the close-ups, right? So like you'd have to figure out a way to get your characters like really close to camera and then also far away from it too, you know, at the same time. I mean, it feels like a really good challenge, actually. 
to be able to pull that off. I love everything you're saying because it's this movie, as I like to rent, mention, I, I describe it in the podcast a lot as just like weird, bold, strange. But right now, there's the gore is not violent gore. It's it's mm. and it's a witch movie kind of and it's a body swap movie and it's all these things. But it's a little I think it's more I think the tone is not what you're describing in a traditional mm-hmm. horror film. But I think you're totally right because I didn't even think about the execution with regard to genre. I was just like, what a great challenge. Like, I really want to be challenged to block in the best way possible and also to not do traditional coverage. Like, I'm just desperate to not do traditional coverage. And because I think the horror yeah. film's my next movie, I just want to do it as soon as possible. I didn't, it was not a strategy guided by logic, it was a strategy guided by impatience. So I'm just like, I just want to do that next and I'll just do it on the horror film. But you're right. It might be like really, really weird. But, yeah, but, but Richard was amazing. Maybe. Maybe. Yeah. We'll see. We'll see. <laughs> we'll bring it up at my next meeting. But yeah, Richard was such such a sweetheart. And also one of those people where you're like, oh, yeah, you're just like a lifetime filmmaker. Like you're kind of yeah. like in that camp of people where like, I really hope I have your attitude. Ooh, seven films down the line. You're probably going to never stop doing it. If you if you're if you got that many movies in you already, like you've got another seven probably. <laughs> you know. So, no, that was awesome. Other thing that's also very interesting, I don't know if called awesome, but it's interesting is this article from IndieWire Wire by Eric Cohn, who's like probably our most quoted and referenced writer for, uh, on the show. It's about the Rotterdam Film Festival firing its programming team and how there really isn't much job security in the film be- business, you know, no matter what side of it you're on, which, you know, seems accurate. It does. A, this article does a really great job of breaking down the importance of programmers, the amount of work they do, and like how they are instrumental to the industry, not just for the festivals they work for. And I feel like Eric <laughs> really like... Man, like you read his articles, like he's so passionate and he's mm-hmm. so like well written and well, like I wasn't going to say spoken. He's obviously not speaking, but like just the way that he like phrases himself is really, really poignant, I guess is the right word. You know, you really believe in his passion. You're like, yeah, that's right. Eric's right. Like these people are really important. They are. But then, and to some extent, it's also like, I don't know, like, like if they didn't exist, if the programming team didn't exist with all their connections to the filmmakers and everything, like what would film festival curation look like? Like, would there be more voices being picked up? Because if you're curating it and you're going after a certain thing that you're interested in that you like, and then you're like liaising, liaising, communicating. Yeah, yeah. Like if you if you have connections with filmmakers that you're following over years, like that kind of insinuates that you're going to be working with those filmmakers from movie to movie to movie and like championing that filmmaker on their next films. So like this system kind of feels like it's it's you know basically designed to limit the amount of movies that might mm. end up in, at film festivals rather than being open to everyone because then it's like well if you don't have the connection to the programmer that you haven't made that relationship with them then the chance of your movie being noticed and appreciated is lower. And so it's almost like, huh, I wonder, is that even the best way? Because is it better that if it's more like a blind submission thing where people like the programmers are looking at all the movies and they're not having bias against certain filmmakers because they have these relationships? Maybe it's better that they just take in the movie and it's the movie for itself by itself. And it's not all the other shit that they have like from their life experience with this filmmaker or even with a genre, you know, that is like kind of influencing their decision making. Like, I don't know, it just made me think and question eric's whole argument like even though he wrote it so clearly and so like passionately it's like well maybe is there is there a better way like is this a good thing to like fire the programming team and like restructure with a brand new programming team is that gonna bring new life to the festival like i don't know that's kind of mind-blowing it's mind-melting to me right now because i came in hot being like this is bullshit why would you fire these programmers they work so hard like they're the curatorial voice on which systems of distribution and marketing are all based on and I really do like Rotterdam I actually spoke at Rotterdam I like went there and I did this whole panel there I met Jane Schoenbrunn there like there's just like lots of things that like I feel in association with made me feel important right I was like oh I'm at Rotterdam you know and then you're right it's like I am then celebrating this old system this old school of reinforcing the status quo gatekeepers (laughs) There, yeah, it's a lot of bullshit. You're right. And I feel really bad for these programmers who lost their jobs because they're there for artist support. I think they're there for the right reasons. 
But I think a repercussion, just like you're talking about, of tracking is nepotism. It's funny. I added a new service to myself as a consultant this year, and I started doing festival lobbying. I'm only doing it for two films right now. And I, for festivals I don't know, I just write in cold and I say, I love this film because X, Y, or, or Z, and this is why you should take a look at it. And then if I know the programmer or the festival head, usually they're like, here's a waiver code. Yes, we'll recommend it. Like there is an effect to someone else reaching on your behalf. And I'm using it to my advantage as a capitalist, as a consultant, as an advocate for these specific filmmakers. But yes, it's absolutely a problem because it's it's breaking down what could be potentially an attempt at a meritocracy. Yeah, it, it's... <laughs> So I don't know about Rotterdam. Rotterdam is specific, right? It sounds like there's internal politics that are problematic. And also, I wanted to acknowledge that Sundance Institute just let go of its film music program. It, It changed up its New Frontier program. It got rid of its pilot program. Like there, there have been new cuts at Sundance because of COVID and because of funding and all these things too. So it feels like in general, there's consolidations and rehirings and reshifting of people in the artist support world. But wouldn't it be nice if there was a way to program in, in a more blind way? Yeah. Yeah. I like that dream. Well, just think if like, you know, like let's say Sundance or South by Southwest or Tribeca or these big film festivals, like what if imagine just fired their whole programming staff after like however many years they've worked there and then just brought completely fresh blood in. Wow. Like a completely new generation of programmers, like who are like in their twenties or thirties or, or whatever, with a completely different background towards film, a completely different mindset of like what is important today in cinema. Like, what would that do? It would change everything. It would be completely different. Like what the movies that would get into Sundance versus what's getting in now. And I mean, that's kind of exciting to me, you know, in, yeah. in a lot of ways. And I'm I'm not trying to say like, oh, fire everybody. Like everyone deserves to get fired. Like I'm not trying to <laughs> to be <laughs> be that person. But it's like, right. well, what if you took like the Sundance programming team and you put them at like Oxford Film Festival, right? Like you like, fucking mix it up, man. Like, you know, it would be completely different. It would be so interesting, like yeah. to see like how these film festivals would change and grow into different ways. Like if you were to, you know, like shake things up a little bit, you know, get the Sundance team to be like, you know, doing scream fest programming. <laughs> like, what would that be? It'd be insane. Yeah. And it would be really interesting, you know? So I don't know. I mean, yeah, I just think that this isn't necessarily a, a bad thing. And I feel like, you know, it, it, clearly like what you said, there's internal politics and they're kind of doing this because they need to do something in order for the festival not to go under because of, the the structure and the way that employment works, uh, you know, is it Denmark? D- where is it? <laughs> oh, it's in the Netherlands. Yeah. So basically, you know, they're, they're fighting all these things, trying to keep the film festival afloat. And it's like, well, I don't really blame them for like trying to keep the festival alive and for trying something new and for challenging expectations. You know, I feel bad for people getting fired, but it's like, I don't know, people get fired, dude. Like, that's just life. Like, deal with it. You know, like you'll find another job. I've been... We've all been fired. We've all lost our jobs. Like we've all found new jobs. Like it's just, you know, if, if you're not willing to be like to, to stand behind yourself as as in your profession and be like, I am good enough to get another job, then I don't know, maybe that's not good. You should you should be able to be confident that like, oh, I've been the programmer at Rotterdam for 20 years. Like I can get another programming job at another film festival or I can move into something else I've never done before. Like within the film industry, like there's lots of opportunities. You know, it's just like, I feel like this whole, this whole reaction to this is like, oh, the poor programmers. It's like, well, they'll be okay, I think. And sure, this is unexpected, but maybe it's good. Maybe. I'm just thinking, what is the system we could set up or encourage where, I don't even know, where curation at distribution companies wasn't so dependent at curation at film festivals. Like, I want film festivals to exist. I think they're a beautiful place where wonderful magic happens. I think you and I have each had our own magical experiences where we've met the right person or had, you know, I... I had this screening at Cleveland of my first film that is literally in the top 10 of best movies, uh, best moments in my entire life. You know, like it was truly magical to be the back of the theater and watching people receive my film the way they have. Nice. But like, what is the world we can set up where it gets as close to a meritocracy as possible? And I don't think it involves film festivals, which is a shame because 
distributors are too reliant on those film festivals for what they presume as quality or marketability or audience. I mean, there's a lot of things that that film festivals, the, the repercussions of the decisions of film festival curation ripple throughout the industry. So it's like, what can we do at the very foundation to shake things up? Okay, here's the craziest idea I've ever had. So uh, take, like, let's say the Film Festival Alliance, right? Let's say all the film festivals that are part of the alliance, like all their programming teams, all became part of one huge group of programmers. And every time a movie was submitted to any of those film festivals, it would be randomly sent to one of the hundreds of programmers across all the festivals. And they wouldn't know what festival that they're curating for, that they were just judging the movie for the movie itself and they would just be rating it for that and then they give their rating and then it goes to that film film festival and then that's how these the ratings get get um you know quantified so you know you're not like oh is this a sundance worthy movie you're just like no is this a a film festival alliance worthy movie is this movie worthy of being a part of this you know thing and knowing that there's like you so many slots for all the movies across so you're not like thinking about like oh like is this one of 20 for sundance you're thinking about what is this one of like 5,000 for the film festival alliance or whatever. And that would just take out a lot of this bias and a lot of this, like, you know, putting your own feeling of of like, is this movie deserving of this? Like, am I going to change this filmmaker's life by getting them into Sundance? Right. And it would be like, you know, is this movie good or is this movie bad? Right. And I think that could help if they did something like that. That would never happen. But what a cool idea to if they tried something like that. <laughs> something like that. And also, like, I was also thinking, though I, I don't, <laughs> I, I'm a little bit laissez-faire with how I, I look at the world. And I, I don't think I truly believe this idea. But like, if you could put a limit on programming certain films, like if it played a certain tier film festival, maybe it can't take over all of the awards at mid-tier film festival, you know, mm-hmm. something, mm-hmm. I, again, I don't want to stifle growth, but maybe there's a world where it's like, y- y- you get a certain amount of points and you can't exploit all the points. I don't know. I'm just trying to figure it out. <laughs> yeah. But it, it's un, it's an unfair system, which is what we're acknowledging. Yeah. Yeah, totally. But but interesting article, and I, I encourage anyone who is interested in film festivals or applying to film festivals to read it, because I think it, it does bring a lot of light to like the way the system is and, you know, the good things and maybe some of the bad things, depending on who you are as reading this article. <laughs> All right. Well, we are sharing a listener email this week from the amazing Francesca Pazanokas. The context is that Francesca has attended both our AMAs and we've got to know her a little bit. And um, she wrote this little, I think it's like a thank you letter, which is very sweet. All right. Hi, all. Thank you for the Q&A and all your helpful answers. I wasn't sure if I should send this or if it would be too cringy, but sometimes you have to embrace the cringe. Full cringe ahead. I worked in theater for a decade, but I was always obsessed with the idea of filmmaking. I hadn't gone to film school and didn't know any filmmakers, so I decided to start listening to one filmmaking podcast each day just to feel like I was making some kind of progress toward my dreams. I found some I liked, Just Shoot It, Script Notes, Fearfulness, etc. But MMIH immediately became my favorite. While waiting for new episodes, I'd listen to MMIH's back catalog every morning and evening on my long subway commute. Your honest discussions and interviews, especially those dissecting personal perceived failures were tremendously liberating. And I really do credit your podcast with demystifying the filmmaker mindset and process and helping me build up the confidence to start making shorts of my own. Getting to hear interviews with female filmmakers I admire was and is always especially thrilling. This week, I finished updating my director's reel, adding in everything I shot last year. It's crazy to me that three years ago, I never shot anything. And now this week, I received a small grant to help fund my next short film. It all started with listening to your podcast, truly. Making movies seemed impossible then, but luckily you helped me realize it's just really, really hard. (laughs) And that's okay. I'm just happy to be making them now. Thanks again and all the best. And we wanted to shout out Francesca's website. It's Francesca Pazanokas, and that's Francesca P-A-Z-N-I-O-K-A-S. Pazniocca. See, now I'm, I fucked it up earlier, but I'm making it better now. FrancescaPazniocas.com. Arik, thoughts on this beautiful letter? Well, thank you so much, Francesca, for the wonderful, wonderful email. I mean, this is, this really means a lot that you have listened so much to the show and that you've gotten so much out of it, you know, and that you started not being a filmmaker. And now three years later, you're making movies like that's like, it was really, really awesome to hear. And that like our advice is partly responsible for that. It's super, super cool. 
you know, that's kind of like, yeah, I, I don't know. I, kinda, I did this, something similar. Like I was listening to to the Scripps Notes podcast when I was trying to, you know, write my first feature and like raise money for my first feature. And that was like what I was kind of doing every day was like writing my, my movie. I would start the day by listening to like a few episodes of Script Notes. And that was like kind of before I started, that was before I started my this podcast with Timothy. And, you know, it was in that search for a, a, a directing podcast was really why we did it because there was no directing podcast at the time to listen to. I was just the script notes guys, which is great, but they're just, they're screenwriters. So I'm just really glad that like the reason why the show was created in the first place, like a need to like hear stories from directors and in- indie filmmakers about making their movies has been helpful for, for you. Cause that was the whole point, the whole reason why we did it. So yeah, thank you for the kind words and thanks for listening and for, you know, taking part of the AMA and being a Patreon of the show, a patron, a Patreon patron. Um, yeah, it just all means a lot. And I looked at your website last night for Chess Guy. I watched some of your work. It's really, really cool. Super different than like what I, you know, what I make and like, you know, what I normally see. So I thought that was like a really encouraging sign that she's really going out there and trying some some different wild stuff. So definitely check out her website. She's got some cool work. Yeah, I I think sometimes it feels like a bubble um, that you and I are in. Like, you know, sometimes my sister will say like, I listen to this or someone will text me or email me and be like, I love that interview. But I would say for the most part, we get less communication than we do have listeners, if that makes sense. So I think it's very easy to forget that we have the potential for impact. And this was very cool reminder that we can have an impact on someone else. So thanks. Like that was like a gift to us. So thank you, Francesca. Yeah. Thank you so much. And to everyone else, you can always send us a question, comment, or suggestion to podcast at makingmoviesishard.com. And you could tell us, you know, maybe why the show needs to be better, even if you wanted to. You don't have to say such nice things as Francesca. You can say whatever you want. We will, we will read it and we will respond and we will likely ask you if we can read it on the show. But if you really like the show, you can leave us a review on iTunes, which is really, really awesome. And finally, you can check us out on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at MMIH Podcast and YouTube at Making Movies is Hard Podcast. Also, make sure to check out the International Screenwriters Association, the ISA. It's an organization designed to connect writers with filmmakers through a number of programs they offer, including publishing your logline to a network of industry professionals, consultation courses, contests, and their top 25 writers list. So head over to networkisa.org to sign up for free today. Thanks to Richard for coming on the show, and thanks to Wendy Zipes Hunter and Susie Cornell from Prana PR for making this happen. Thanks to our editors, Jeff Reimut, for doing the editing, and as always, thanks to our producer, Eric Toms, for simply being awesome. Thanks so much, everybody, and we'll talk to you next week. How do you say your last name, Richard? Uh, well, my dad used to say anything but lead ass. <laughs> it, uh, uh, leads. Uh, leads. <laughs>